Welcome to the course Symbols and Signs and to this lecture which is entitled Symbols as Survivals. In this course we look at what various anthropological theories about symbols can tell us about what it is to be human. In other words, in order to understand what it is to be human, we look at the various anthropological theories about symbols. In this lecture, we're going to look at Fraser's theory of symbols and what this theory can tell us about being human. Fraser's theory holds that some symbols are survivals. The basic idea I'm going to go through is that our prehistoric ancestors believed that by using magic, they could preserve the soul or spirit of a thing so that when the body dies, the spirit lives on. Primitive tribes all around the world still hold on to these beliefs, but civilized nations have advanced. Even so, in these civilizations, we can see magical beliefs and rituals still surviving in the form of symbols. So to show you this, I'm going to structure the lecture as follows. First, I'm going to introduce evolutionary anthropology to you. Then I'm going to look at the problem, which is the problem of the Nimi priesthood. Then I'm going to consider the Norse story of Balder the Beautiful. And then I'll provide the solution to the problem that uh, Fraser sets out to answer, which is namely that the golden bough is probably mistletoe. <clears throat> We're going to look at uh, the detail of what Fraser thought prehistoric magical thought consisted in and at the symbolic survivals of this thought. And then I will conclude the lecture. So I'm going to start with evolutionary anthropology. The modern discipline that is known as socio-cultural -anthropo socio anthropology or social anthropology or cultural anthropology, either way, I'll just call it anthropology today, starts from the 1870s. It was in the 1870s that a man named Fraser was given a position in anthropology, the first position in anthropology at a university in England. Now we're going to be looking today at Fraser and his theory of the golden bough, but we'll also look at, uh, sorry, we won't consider, but I should also say that some of Fraser's contemporaries included Tyler, who wrote a book entitled Primitive Culture, and Morgan, who wrote a book entitled Ancient Society. Now, the reason why we call it evolutionary anthropology is that all these thinkers thought that human society progresses through stages. For Morgan, we all began as savages. Then some people developed into barbarians. And from the barbarians, some people developed into civilized nations. For Tyler, we all started off with animistic thoughts. We then developed into polytheistic thoughts, and then we had monotheism. In other words, we started believing that there were spirits in uh, rocks and trees. Then we started to believe that there were many gods. Then we believed that there was one god. <clears throat> For Fraser, we all believed once in magic. Then we developed into believing in religion, and then we developed into believing in science. So in all of these theories, there's a development. There's a moving forward, which we call evolution, or which they which we call evolution in relation to evolutionary anthropology. Now, I don't know when to introduce this, but there are a lot of problems with this thinking, and it certainly is not um, accepted these days in anthropology, and I'll get back to that later. But I'll also say that I think there's some useful information to be got from this theory and some useful insights into what it is to be human. But for the meantime, a bit more a bit about evolutionary anthropology. So the different schools in anthropology, it's not so much as they answer the same question, give different answers to the same question, but rather it's more that they set different kinds of questions. So the kinds of questions that evolutionary anthropologists um, posed are, 
where has um, modern society come from? That is, what are the origins? What were the first humans? What were their original thoughts? Were they animistic? Were they magical thoughts? What are these primitive thoughts? And what are the stages through which human societies have progressed? How have we evolved after this? Have we gone from um, savagery to barbarianism to civilization, or from believing in spirits in the rocks into believing in many gods into believing in one god? Now, important idea for this is the notion of survival. This is beliefs and practices which are still practiced today, but the original meaning of them might now be lost. Now, I'll give you an example. Um, I'm actually recording this on a Friday, and I'm already feeling like fish and chips. And I'm recording this in Australia, where a lot of other Australians are already looking forward to fish and chips. And these include Muslims, Christians, Jews, atheists, everybody in Australia, it seems, the most popular day for fish and chips is Friday. Now, why is this? Well, it turns out that it used to be, that, and still is, that some, particularly Catholics, like to honour Friday, which is the day that um, Jesus Christ, their Saviour and Messiah, was supposed to have been, uh, was supposed to have died in the first instance. <clears throat> oh, sorry, just died on the cross, I should say, when Jesus Christ died on the cross. So to honour that, they abstain from eating meats and fish, apparently used to be a form of abstinence from eating um, meat. Excuse me. So, that old practice, that old tradition of um, not eating, uh, um, excuse me, of, of not eating meat, turned into eating fish on Fridays, and now even people who are not Christian and who don't belong to that kind of older Australian tradition tend to eat fish on Fridays more than any, any other day of the week. Um, so that's the idea of a survival. So now let's um, move to the, the particular problem that Fraser's is trying to solve. We've looked at evolutionary theory, um, even evolutionary anthropology in general, now I want to specifically look at the theory associated with um, Fraser, because Fraser, more than any other anthropologist, gave us insights into um, symbols. And I'll have a quick drink before my mouth dry and, and throat dries out. The problem that Fraser attempts to solve, we could call the rights of Nimi, or the Nimi priesthood, or the king of the woods. And it refers to a classical, um, a, pr a practice recorded in the classical literature, the literature of ancient Rome. It used to be, the old Roman writers tell us, writing in Latin, it used to be that there, that in the forest around Nemi, a little town out side of Rome. In a little town outside of Rome called Nemi, there's a forest nearby, a forest on the mountain. In that forest was a man who was called the king of the forest or the king of the wood, the king of Nemi woods. Now, in order to become, oh sorry, now, now that king who was the king of the woods is an ex-slave who has now become the king. And the way he became this king was by taking a branch off a tree and killing the old king, who was a slave himself, initially a slave. So the king takes the branch off a tree, sorry, so the slave takes the branch off the tree and kills the king and becomes the king himself. He becomes, if you like, the, the priest of Nimi or the king of Nimi. And we can see this in the image here. <clears throat> here is the slave. In this in this version, it's not a, a branch he's got, but a knife who has just killed the old king and is now being hailed by these maidens, I gather, as the new king. Rex King Nemorensis, the king of Nemi. So the idea here, again, is that... Uh, a slave comes along, picks out a, a branch of a tree, and kills the old king, and becomes king himself. 
Now, do you think this slave feels, this slave who has now become a king feels very confident in his new position? Well, I would say no. The problem is he knows that the next slave who comes along and picks this, picks this magical branch off the tree and comes and kills can come and kill him and become king himself. So if you're the king of Nimi, you were once a slave, you got a branch and you killed the last king, you become king yourself, but you know sooner or later somebody else is going to come along and ki kill you. Now Fraser says, how do we explain this ritual? This barbaric ritual, he says, does not belong in ancient Rome because it was ancient Rome was a civilized place, so it must have survived from an earlier period. So what he's going to do is look for parallels of the elements of elements in the story, which can be found elsewhere. So he turns to rituals and myths throughout the world, and he spends 12 volumes doing this. The method he uses to solve the problem, in other words, is what we call dismissively these days. We use it as a bad word. We call it armchair anthropology. So the method Fraser is going to use is to find similar beliefs and practices in other cultures and assume that all these beliefs and practices originate from the same culture or the same practices, which is the primitive culture of our ancestors. So to repeat, he's an evolutionary anthropologist. He's interested in the very what our distant prehistoric ancestors once believed and did, and how that has been transmitted or changed when we trace down to the present. So he looks around the world and finds many, in, many different stories and elements to this story of the Nimi priesthood to help explain what's going on. One of the crucial stories he refers to is the Norse myth, the myth of Balder the Beautiful. Now you've probably heard of the uh, Norse gods. You've probably heard of Thor, the god of thunder. You've probably heard of Loki, the trickster, the joker, god. You might not have heard of Balder. Balder was famous for being the, ha the most handsome, the wisest, the mildest, and the most popular of the Norse gods. All the gods loved him so dearly that one of the goddesses by the name of Frigg made everybody promise, swear, to never hurt Balder. And she went around the universe, making everything swear to this. But she neglected one thing. There was some mistletoe on a tree at the farthest ends of the universe. And she forgot to make that mistletoe swear not to hurt Balder. I think you can guess what's going to happen next, more or less. Loki the trickster god is jealous of Balder and all the way all the gods love him and he devises a cunning plan to get rid of Balder. He knows Balder is, immo is, is immortal so all the gods love to play jokes like they, they, they will fire arrows at him or throw spears at him and even though they would hit Balder he would never die, and everybody thought that was a great joke. So Loki thought he'd play a trick. He went to the end of the universe and got this mistletoe, and he gave it to one of the blind gods, who didn't realise what it was. And this blind god threw this mistletoe at Loki. And even though the spears and arrows couldn't kill... Sorry, at, at Balder. And even though the, 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 the um, arrows and spears could not kill Boulder, the mistletoe could. And mistletoe, as you know, is this plant. We would call it a parasite. It's like a, a weed that grows on top of trees, particularly in winter when all their leaves have fallen. Anyway, it's with that mistletoe that Boulder is killed. And all the gods experience such terrible grief and remorse and sorrow that it's never been felt ever since. Since, And 
I suppose here's the picture. Here's a blind god. I'm assuming that's Lockie there. I assume this is the blind god with his mistletoe, branch of mistletoe that's gone right through poor old Balder. And, he, and all the gods are so devastated. They lay Balder on this boat, which is then rolled out into the sea and set on fire and cast away. So that's the story of Balder the Beautiful. And in this story, in this Norse story, which comes from the, from the north of Europe, whereas the Nimi story comes from the south of Europe, Fraser thinks he's found basically the same story. He thinks the golden bough over which the king of the wood in Italy kept watch and ward was a branch of mistletoe that was growing on an oak in the forest in Nimi. And he says, and this is, this is, these are quotes from the golden bough, there is a parallel between the king of the wood and the Norse god Boulder, who was said to have perished by a stroke of the mistletoe. So here we have actual mistletoe growing in a tree. And here is, I suppose, that would be the king of the wood. Or perhaps it's um, Lockie killed by a mistletoe. As Fraser writes, both had deposited their lives or souls for safety in the parasite, which is growing on an oak. So according to Fraser, the, our prehistoric ancestors believed to keep somebody or something safe, you deposit their soul somewhere else for safekeeping. Um, one example would be uh, the life force of Superman. Superman lives on Earth, but his planet is, um, I think it's called Krypton, correct me if I'm wrong, and, and on Krypton you find Kryptonite. And that's basically the origin of Superman's power, but also the cause of his downfall. So if you can get, this is the, there's this kind of idea, if you like, lives on in modern cartoon um, characters. So the idea here is that um, in both the Nimi ritual and in the story of Balder and in the story of Superman, there's an idea and, and countless other folk stories that um, Fraser elaborates in depth and at length, you find a similar, pra similar principle that you can deposit a soul for safekeeping somewhere else. But wherever that, that soul or life force resides is also can be detrimental to the, to the person, him or herself, as it is to Lockie whose soul is kept in the mistletoe, according to Fraser, but he's killed by the mistletoe. Or the king of the wood, whose soul resides in the mistletoe, but is killed by the mistletoe. Or, oh, I won't keep on going. <laughs> okay, I'm sure you're getting bored by this stage. So according to Fraser, though, this answers another question, which is the general question of the external soul in popular superstition. The external soul, again, is... Uh, Lockie's soul in the mistletoe, but also in the fire festivals of Europe, since fire played a part in both the myth of Balder, because Balder is burned, and the myth, and the king of the wood, because the rituals associated with that story in um, ancient Rome also included fire. So these are fire festivals. Now Fraser spends five or six chapters in the Golden Bough discussing the different fire festivals. And so this is a big part of his theory. And we'll get to that in a second. So, the, But the solution to the Golden Bough idea is mistletoe, that the king is the personification of the tree. The mistletoe is where the tree's or the king's soul resides. And thus the king's life or death resides in it too. So now we're getting at, and I'm going to mention the word Jesus Christ just in case I forget that. If we treat it not, we can treat it... if we. If you're a Christian, that's fine. You can treat it um, as, as something that really happened. But also as an anthropologist, you can treat it as a story which has similarities to um, the King of the Wood story and the rites of Nemi. And I won't go into that detail, but I want you to, to keep that in mind. The idea is that um, the king's soul resides elsewhere not in the actual physical body, and that it can survive death. So the idea is, um, by by placing the soul in the mistletoe, 
the mistletoe can kill the body but preserve the soul. Now, if you think about mistletoe, it grows on a tree. In the middle of winter, the tree looks to our prehistoric ancestors dead. All the leaves have fallen off. And yet the life force, the mistletoe, as, the prehistoric, as our prehistoric ancestors understood it, survives and brings the tree back to life in the same way that the, if you like, um, the king of the wood is reborn. So the tree is reborn. But also, more importantly, the sun. Um, if you think about for our prehistoric ancestors who lived in the high latitudes, that is closer to the North and South Pole rather than to the equator, they would have noticed the sun's power, they would have noticed more clearly the sun's power waning as you get towards the middle of winter. They would have feared, this is the, we're using lots of wood halves, which are my most um, feared word in anthropology. But anyway, this is how um, Fraser proceeds. They would have feared that the sun itself was dying and they need to keep the, the soul of the sun alive. And they do this through magic. They, they set a fire which keeps the, 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 which is the soul of the sun and brings the soul of the sun back to life in a, in a new physical body, the new sun that is born after solstice. So um, as far as the king of the wood, it, it was he was burned symbolically every forest in every every summer in the Nimi forest. So I mean I think that would in this case it's a celebration of the life of the spirit. But also this can happen as Fraser points out at different times of the year. But the fire itself our prehistoric ancestors used this fire in a ritual way to maintain the strength of the sun and thus to maintain life on earth. So it's quite profound, right? The idea is that mistletoe or the golden bough is life after death. And the king, and this is why we get this idea of the king is dead, long live the king. A king can die, his physical body can die, but his, his spirit or soul then goes and resides in the new king. And when we, and also kind of magical forces, which is the death and burning of the god, in this case, Boulder, um, it's a kind of fire. And when you burn Boulder, you allow him to continue, according to phrase. In the same way, when you burn a fire, you allow the light of the sun to continue, even when it appears to be dying. Now, I've pointed out these two points are here of sympathetic or imitative magic. Now I'm going to go into a bit more detail about them now. So according to Fraser, our prehistoric ancestors thought they could control the world through magic. A lot of this magic was based on the principle of sympathy. That is, like causing like or things that have been touching continuing to be touching. In other words, sympathetic magic can be based on the like produces like um, idea, which we could call similarity or homeopathic principles. An example of a homeopathic principle is um, this voodoo doll. If this voodoo doll, if I make this voodoo doll of, um, let's say, <laughs> president of the United States, who I don't like, now that's a really bad example. That's a form of um, treachery, isn't it? Oh, just, okay, to someone I really don't like, I use a, um, a form of treason. I don't want to be committed for treason here. So let's, no, I love all the United States presidents. So let's just pretend this is someone I really hate um, from the opposing football team. And I want to make sure that they can't kick any goals on the weekend. I put a pin in their I make a doll that looks like them and put a pin in their leg so that they strain their leg in the first um, few minutes of the game and then can't kick any goals. So that's a homeopathic principle. You've probably heard of it because um, in terms of homeopathic medicine, well, in this case, it's, this is for evil, but homeopathic med medicine is supposed to be for good and works on similar principles of, of like causing like. Um, so that what Fraser would call a prehistoric magical thought still persists today in um, homeopathic medicine.
The other principle, the other principle of magic, the other principle of, of sympathy, of sympathetic magic is con contact or contagion. The idea here is that things which have touched continue to act on each other. Um, when I was a young boy, I had an older friend, also called Nick, and he had a necklace with a shark's tooth on it. And I thought that was the coolest thing because it made him look tough and fierce like I wanted to be as a six-year-old boy. Now, that shark's tooth, I presume, had come from a shark and thus was associated with a, a ter terrifying, fierce force of the deep. And the, the tooth has that. And if Nick could put it around his neck, he would also have that terrifying and fierce thought. So I wanted it myself. Another, another example that of contact and contagion is if you really hate me and you notice that um, I rub my eyes and an eyelash falls off, you can grab that eyelash and maybe take it home and say some prayers or mantras and then burn that eyelash. As a result of you burning that eyelash, um, I will suffer. So that's the contact or contagion principle. So the sympathy has two forms. The, the, principle, the magical principles of sympathy have two forms. One is of the homeopathic principle of similar looking things continuing to act on each other. The other is the principle of contact or contagion, which is things that have um, once touched each other continuing to act on each other. <coughs> Excuse me. So according to Fraser, both of these principles are a false science. They belong to um, of the savage and, the, and ignorant and dull-witted people everywhere. So he thought that our ancestors and anybody who still believes that is savage, ignorant or dull-witted. So now we turn to the idea of the survival. Now according to Fraser, now this is where symbols come into it more um, more significantly. So far we've looked at our prehistoric ancestors and what Fraser says they believed that they could continue the life or, of a soul or a spirit even after the physical body had died by using magic. Now according to Fraser modern civilized people don't believe in magic anymore they believe in science. Nevertheless, the beliefs of our prehistoric ancestors continue till today in the form of symbols which have survived through the millennia. So he sees ritual uses of fire as a kind of symbol. He says some modern symbols are survivals of magic thought, and these include fire, bonfires, which we have, for example, um, well, when I was a boy in England, we had them for Guy Fawkes Day. Um, we have symbolic fires at Christmas, like the candles or lights on a Christmas tree or the burning of the Yule log. So what we're doing without realising it there is symbolically continuing on the old magical beliefs of our prehistoric ancestors who believed they could continue the spirit or life of the sun even when the sun was dying. And also their belief in the power of mistletoe as a plant of fertility. It, grow, which, it grows on the oak and, and it is, if you like, the soul of the oak. And it's the soul, even when the oak tree or other trees seem to be dying because all their leaves have, have, have been lost, the mistletoe continues to live. So the bonfire is, if you like, a symbolic resonance of the old imitative or homeopathic use of magic to rekindle the sun. And this has survived through evolution as a symbol. So it survived through, it came from the period when we believed in magic. It survives through the period of religion when we believed in, well, <laughs> Fraser, I think, was pretty skeptical about Catholicism. So when we believed in religion and even into the period of science, so, in other words, we once believed we could control the uncontrollable. We could we could use magic to 
control the world, to keep the sun alive, to maintain, make something live after it died. Then we progressed to realize that we can't control the uncontrollable. And rather, we surrendered to an all-powerful God who would, who would petition through prayer to intercede, to get involved in the world on our behalf. Then we developed a scientific understanding, which allows us to recognize the order of the universe and predict it without the use of God or magic. Nevertheless, some symbols survive and they point back to our savage or magical prehistory. Now, elements of the theory we still find compelling, but generally, as a whole, the theory is thought to be not just misleading, but politically very problematic. Okay, so what are the problems? Firstly, it's kind of like a just-so story. You remember what I was saying before? Our prehistoric ancestors would have done this, and then they would have done that, blah, blah, blah. Like I say, whenever I hear would have, I get a bit worried. Um, and what, or it must, they must have done this. All this stuff, in the absence of, ev of any evidence, is just unverifiable. It's like a just-so story. How did the site try, try, try get its stripes for well, once there was a, um, I don't know, a zebra ran into him and the crop and the stripes ran off. You can make up any other any story to explain why the tiger got its stripes. It doesn't prove that's how the tiger got its stripes. The same way you can make up any stories about what our magical what what our ancestors must have believed doesn't be, doesn't mean that's what they did believe. Um, now I suppose Fraser would respond to that, but you say, well, look, I've got evidence from all around the world of these stories that are so similar. It can't be. It, it didn't spread throughout the world from one place. What happened? That, that's he doesn't believe in this other theory of the spreading of ideas, which is, um, by the way, if you like the contrasting idea during this period, this pre-war period of anthropology. People like Boaz from about the 1890s came along and said, "Look, I, re I think the reason why we find the similar ideas in different parts of the world is, is very similar. Simple, they just spread. One culture took them to another culture, which took them to another culture, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Well, Fraser doesn't accept that. He said, no, the only way we can explain why these elements like bonfires or whatever or mistletoe type beliefs are so common is that they come from the prehistoric ancestors that we all shared. Okay, so that's problem number one. Problem number two is with the evolutionary approach. Now, um, for those of you who want to go into more advanced anthropology, sometimes instead of uh, evolutionary approach, we also use the word teleology, which is spelt T-E-L-E-O-L-O-G-Y. Um, it's used by anthropologists with a slightly different meaning to that, which you might be familiar with in um, philosophy. Um, for anthropologists, it's, just, it's, it's a simpler meaning. It's just basically the idea that societies advance through time. <coughs> Excuse me. So, the pro there are problems with, t with, with the model that Tyler, Morgan and, and Fraser used. So, Fraser takes European history as a model. He sees that, that European history went through what, he's, what he thought was this initial period of um, savagery, then moved on to barbarism and then to civilization. So, even if we accept this model, and by the way, I should say there are a lot of reasons why we should not accept that model. But even if we do accept the model, how can we expect that other societies should follow that model? Why should other societies in Africa or America follow the model that the, the West followed? The other, is, the other problem is the assumption that we, as in, and in this case we're talking about the we, which is the people with whom Tyler be, uh, Fraser belonged and who... Fraser was writing for, the Europeans and North Americans, the assumptions that we are advanced and they are backward. In other words, why put science in a time frame as being advanced and magic if it really does belong to other people as in a time frame of being backward? From a modern perspective, from a contemporary anthropological perspective, these are just different theories. Um, now, I should say all these points here, A, B, C, D, and we could probably go on E, F, G, H, I, J, will all be 
revolving around the same idea that the evolutionary approach to human history is flawed. But I'll give you another phrase which comes from the title of a book by by the name of a guy by, by a guy by the name of Wolf, Europe and the People Without History. And basically Wolf sets out in a fantastic opening chapter this idea that's that perpetuates in still in contemporary Western societies that Europe and North America, European people have a history where the rest of the world has been pretty much static through the millennia. This is a common idea and even people who openly might challenge it, it still sort of seeps into their thinking because it's so it's so preponderant, if you like, in Western thought. And put another way, there's this presumption of European history, at least, as progress and improvement and history as a march of progress, which is a very culturally specific idea and, in fact, difficult to prove in an anthropological sense. <coughs> so again, all these things, uh, all these issues I've raised are problems with the idea of evolution. Now, the armchair anthropology, another problem is methodological. It relates to the armchair anthropology I talked about before. Um, and the guy who was pretty much more than anybody else responsible for the demise of evolutionary anthropology as a way of understanding the world which is Malinowski. And in his classic work, The Argonauts, Argonauts of the Western Pacific, he writes, much has been said and written about survival. Yet the survival character of an act is expressed in the way in which it is character carried out. Blah, blah, blah. I won't read the whole quote. You can if you, you want to pause. The point is, Malinowski says, you've got to go to the places and see what they're doing. Are they actually still doing these rites that uh, Fraser talks about? When they do them, do they do them seriously or as a joke? And how do you know what the meaning is unless you're there and actually talk to people who are involved? Maybe they interpret it in a completely different way. Fraser, you have no right just to collect, this is what he's implicitly saying, even though he had a kind of uh, strange Oedipal relationship, and we'll get to what an Oedipal relationship is in another lecture, a strange kind of Oedipal relationship with Fraser of love and hate. Um, what he's saying in a, in a roundabout way is, Fraser and your friends, how can you carry on like this? You don't know what it's actually like. You've got to go and visit these societies and live with the people and know what they're doing before you can attribute any meaning to their to their acts, symbolic or otherwise. So there's um, the methodology that they use became untenable. And in fact, Malinowski in World War I undertakes um, the first classic example of ethnography. Other people had gone and lived with with uh, with uh, other societies prior to Malinowski, but Malinowski sort of set the benchmark for how to do it in World War I. Okay, in defense. Firstly, before I get to this slide, actually, I just want to say more generally that how influential Golden Bow was. It was probably the, the most, it's probably the most important book in the history of anthropology in as much as it brought awareness to the world of the subject of anthropology. It has, it attracted the attention of many a people, of many a person, I should say, outside of anthropology. Wittgenstein, the famous philosopher was obsessed with this book and other people continue to return to it. And in the early 20th century, at least, it's probably the, one of the most important books on the bookshelf of any intelligent person. That in itself is not a reason to like the book, but there are some things I think that are uh, redeemable about the, uh, the theory and the book. Firstly, in contrast to a lot of people at the time, now remember he's writing from about the 1870s. In Australia, Aboriginal Australians were considered both formally and, you know, for legal reasons and outside of the law in general understanding as being little other than just animals. They were considered, in other words, as uh, part of the flora and fauna, the vegetation and animal life of Australia. Even if we go into the 1900s, there's an infamous example in America where an African man is taken from Africa and put in a zoo in a primate exhibition. People who are thinking and acting like this refuse to see 
non-white Europeans, sorry, non-white people outside Europe as human. They perceived black people, etc., as being subhuman. Fraser implicitly says we all had the same ancestors. We all come from the same human, the same prehistoric ancestors. Therefore, we are all human, is, is what I get from Fraser. These asserting that they are humans just like we are. In fact, at one point, he talks about magical thinking, which he abhors, but he says, it exists among the ignorant and superstitious classes of modern Europe and in the lowest savages surviving in the remotest corners of the world. So he, he's very dismissive, but at the same time, he is allowing for these people to be just as human as the ignorant and superstitious of Europe, which by today's standards is not much, but by the standards of his day was strikingly anti-racist and perhaps more anti-racist than many of us could have claimed to be. The thinking of Fraser is also finding some new theoretical relevance, particularly in the works of Taussig and Graeber, um, which I might discuss in another lecture. So that's another relevance or importance for studying Fraser. So in summary, anthropology uses different theories to pose different questions. And in this course, we're looking at what different theories about symbols, what different anthropological theories about symbols can tell us about what it is to be human. So Fraser's question is, how do we account for the origins and evolutions of thought? The basic is, idea is we all once believed in magic. We believed that if we burnt a fire in a ritual, we could magically keep the sun alive or allow the sun to be reborn in the new year. Um, in the same way, if you kill a god or a king with a magical life force like the mistletoe, the god's spirit or king or god's or king spirit moves to a new king or god by magical force. It is a magical way of thinking that our ancestors used. It is a way of thinking which is essentially wrong and which has been superseded, but which still exists today in the form of symbols. It still survives today in the form of symbols. And that is Fraser's theory about symbols and humans. Thank you very much.